What's happening? Welcome to the 71st episode of the Slap Stream with Georgia, live from Slapsville. And you probably noticed that I'm not in my home, I'm not in a random hotel room. So I'm for the first time at um, this red pad on my today's guest. And uh, I really enjoy this vibe. So I might be doing this more often like this. So who knows? COVID is hopefully done so we might get a chance to do this more often um i would like to mention that uh, my today's guest miles he will be answering your questions so if you have any question uh feel free to uh write in the live chat which is i believe on this side uh on youtube so make sure to ask questions and i'm sure that you will because once you see his awesome instrument and his awesome playing you're gonna you would like to know more about him and but i would do my best to ask him everything that uh, that i'm interested in, but i'm sure that i'm gonna forget something so if you have a question for miles send uh write a question on the in the live chat of this video uh, before I start introducing my today's guest, I would like to thank to all the Patreons that signed up for my Patreon. And if you have not done that, make sure to do that. I offer some pretty cool perks. Um, I'm not super regular over there, but I'm doing my best to 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 be. So uh, if you feel like supporting my work, uh, check that out. If you have not subscribed to the channel, hit that subscribe button and slap the like because that helps the weird YouTube algorithm. And what else? Uh, make sure to follow all the Instagram, Facebook, Art of Slap Base, all of that, that it's um, in the description of this video. And um, oh, and check out these awesome Art of Slab Base t-shirts have a couple designs available at bullfiddle cat clothing and the description is i mean the link is in the description of this video as well uh be be uh, without further ado i would like to introduce my guest for today it's uh, a good friend of mine awesome bass player awesome luthier and bass maker instrument maker and all around great guy miles j Hey Miles, what's happening? George, what's happening, brother? It's I'm really glad to have you here in Slapsville, which is uh, your own apartment in the Slapsville, if you didn't know for today. Can you imagine that this been this is a 71st episode of the Slapstream? Congratulations, man. <laughs> that's, but no, that's some that's some serious uh, gumption to start that up during COVID and have so many interesting guests, man. So honor to be here. And join this company. <laughs> I'm really glad that uh, that you're here, and um, I would like to focus this episode on your whole career, on your life. So whatever you feel like sharing, um, please do. And first, I would like to ask you how, what were you been doing like during uh, this these crazy times, the the pandemic and COVID, and hopefully it's the the end of that whole mess. But like. How did you survive? How did you do the music? Yeah, well, COVID, I mean, God, it was so different for everybody. And, uh, you know, some, I mean, so many hardships and so many struggles and challenges. And then also just so much weird downtime where you suddenly had a lot more freedom over what to spend your time doing. So uh, I spent a lot of time here in my place, writing a lot of music spent a lot of time in the mountains just outside my back door hiking a bunch um, I made some more instruments and made some more furniture I make a lot of the furniture and stuff you see around here and studio setups and stuff like that in addition to some instruments so I was able I was able to keep myself pretty busy and um, also give myself plenty of new things kind of fun things to learn and weird challenges to to take on have you been playing music much during COVID yeah, I mean, I was pretty much mostly playing music during COVID or or building stuff. I was either playing music, building stuff, or kind of outside. Well, that's good. Since, you know, most of the gigs were pretty much gone and dead. And then and now it's 
hopefully coming back. I'm going to be going back on the road with my band's Tiger Army soon. And mm-hmm. I recently started playing with a big band. So gigs are, I guess, slowly coming back in, in L.A. Uh, I would like to know a little bit more about your beginnings. How did you discover music? How did you discover bass? How did you discover slap bass? Is bass your first instrument and all that fun stuff? Yeah, well, thank you, man. And it's nice to talk to you about this because you have been such an inspiration and amazing musician that I've been watching too over the years. So it's good to be in the same room as you. Um, my dad was a bass player, is a bass player. He's an electric bass player. And I grew up in a sort of a bass player recording studio type of house. Um, he was recording a lot. My dad's name is Stephen J. And um, he was recording for a lot of different bands around LA when I was just a young kid. And then he opened his own recording studio and was doing all kinds of odd jobs. So I was lucky to have a kind of a sort of, you know, co-pilot seat at the studio some nights when he was mixing and working on sessions. And back in those days, he was running an Atari 16 track. So it was all punching. And I remember he would let me do some of those (laughs) punches (laughs) if the client wasn't looking. Um, But I guess I got fairly good at them. Anyway, um, my dad is an amazing musician uh, in his backstory, and I feel like to tell my story, I kind of start a little bit with that family place, because in addition to being a bass player, he also spent numerous years traveling around the world and recording music and exploring music in different countries, and um, that, I think, really shaped who he became as a musician and who, in turn, raised me, and so my backstory in music was one of them. a lot of interest in outward looking to other cultures, musics, uh, a lot of interest in getting to know the people and the reasons and the circumstances behind different music traditions. And um, of course, just a lot of fun playing around in the studio and experimenting and, you know, all that comes from the sort of musical tinkering. Uh, does that mean that bass was your first instrument? Bass was not really my first instrument. I started on saxophone. I played trombone. I started upright bass when I was kind of late, like a senior in high school. Oh, so... Or I, sophomore in high school. Okay. I didn't have a clue that you played the saxophone. Did you play any other <laughs> instruments? I played some... Yeah, I mean, I picked up a bunch of little things as a kid, piano lessons and stuff like that. But I was mostly into bicycles when I was a teenager. So music was always like fun, but not the main thing. Bikes were the main thing. And then when I found the upright bass then it sort of shifted. And I guess I'll just add that to your question because I found the upright bass I started playing on in a family friend's, well, a very, very close family friend's closet. And we went over there around the holidays and they asked me to put something in the closet and I walked into that closet and there was this beautiful upright bass in there that had been in, it was played by this man, Bob Meyer, and he had left it to his daughter who married my dad's best friend. And he played that bass in the Les Paul band uh, the Tonight Show band, um, numerous other orchestras. So you can actually see the the regular upright that I play in a lot of funny places online. That's such a cool story. <laughs> and um, do you remember uh, what was your first band? My first band was a ska band called oh. the, the Dexters with my brother and Matt Shima and Graham Labasse and Ross Bushnell. <laughs> <laughs> was that in, uh, in high school? That was in high school. Are you still in touch with those guys? Uh, yeah, actually, a lot of them. I should be more in touch with some of them, but I love them all. Yeah, we had a lot of good memories together. You mentioned your dad. Like, did you, did, uh, your dad, he doesn't play an opera. He plays an electric? Yeah, mainly, uh, mainly electric, yeah. Uh, oh, he, so he does play upright as well, huh? He plays some upright. It's not, it's not like what he like, spends a lot of time working on, but but uh and he doesn't have an actual upright up there i mean he has some electric ones but but uh yeah he does it for if he needs to but he's mainly an electric player is he a jazz guy i would say more funk guy more funk guy but he's very experimental too he's his new album is crazy experimental howard levy's on it victor wooten's on it it's a bunch of bunch of really wild stuff so that's so cool you showed me this photo that is hanging on, on your wall with your dad and Marcus Miller and Victor Booten and your oh, brother yeah. and it's so cool. <laughs> Let me get you that. Photo time. I don't know how much you can see, but yeah. This is at Victor Wooten's uh, base camp in Tennessee 
and Marcus Miller was there, and my brother's there, Bob Francisconi, and uh, Future Man. That's awesome. Um, do you teach at, your, at that camp, or what do you do over there? Um, my dad was my dad was primarily, I would say, the sort of man of interest because <laughs> he's such an interesting man. So Victor and my dad have a friendship, and Victor invited us out to do some workshops there partially on playing but more on an idea that um, my dad my brother and I have been kind of developing a sort of way of looking at rhythmic har har harmony and rhythm in music and their sort of parallels and fractals and relationships so we mainly went there to sort of talk about that but then we played some sets and uh, did some workshops as well that's awesome can't imagine how it is like in a talking base for uh, for a week or whatever the uh, I don't know how long did that camp last a few days that camp goes for a few days I think we would we would always kind of come in and, and come back out so I was never there for the full duration but they do all kinds of amazing activities my favorite one being a string walk which is like Victor sets up a string going through the forest and you put on a blindfold and you just have to walk with your hand on that string carefully putting each foot and it, with your eyes closed, blindfolded, it really forces you to rely on all your other senses. And that was like the coolest thing to do that for like a half hour and then go into a studio to play music. It's, it, it does something to your head. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of really great things there to appreciate. That's so cool. Uh, we're gonna talk more about your music, but you, you mentioned your uh, dad's new album. Is, it, is, he, is he also influenced by world music like you are or? Yeah, very much. My dad, Steve J, he recorded he recorded a bunch of music in West Africa in the 1970s when he was just there with my mom traveling around on a on a, you know, backpack style reel to reel recorder and none such records later released those as their West African Explorer series. So, my dad had a heavy influence from West African drumming and then um so yeah, I, when I was growing up, there was that sort of there was their environment around me, you know, drums and a lot of different musicians. My dad played with uh, Joe Higgs, if you're familiar with that reggae artist, Joe Higgs, kind of even pre-Bob Marley. But a lot of that band was coming from the Whalers. So when I was a kid, my dad had, you know, a lot of <laughs> Jamaican musical royalty around. Um, a lot of musicians came through the house and through the studio in those days. And everybody kind of brought a little bit of experience or a little story or just some kind of little thing that would kind of perk my interest or, or I would say in, in retrospect planted a seed that would bear fruit you know years and years later down the road but I, I definitely like the diverse community coming through the door that was really nice and I try to keep it that way in my life now too that's so awesome I can't imagine like having anything better like for the start of a, uh, uh, of a musician than being exposed to all these different music styles it's, it's so cool it's, it's great yeah it was thank you um, I would like to hear you play your uh, beautifully look, looking bass that you made. And we're going to talk a lot about it during the show. Uh, but I would like to show the Slapstream audience a little bit of your playing. So Sure. Uh, let's um, do something. Here's this bass. I, made, I built and made this bass and designed it. Um, it's a long story. <laughs> Maybe too many little chapters just for this interview, but the instrument, um, I'll just sort of stand back so you can see it in full view. So it's a full scale, like 41 and a half inch string upright bass, but I made the back very small um, and I used a skin on the top. And I did that for a couple of reasons. I did that so I could basically have a full scale acoustic transportable upright bass which were three things that were very hard for me to find when I was looking at these and um, I came back from a trip a tour in Norway uh, with uh, yeah with some ECM artists jazz tour and my regular upright bass the one that I was still borrowing from my dear friend Don in high school um, I was still borrowing that bass and the headstock got broken off of it. So I realized I needed a travel bass because this old beautiful instrument was just too precious to risk going around the world with. And I couldn't find anything that <clears throat> sort of 
suited me, I guess you could say at the time, mainly that it was acoustic, full scale, and portable. So I took some inspiration from a lot of other instruments I had been exposed to in those years. Um, I started making this in 2008. Went like this a little bit. I made this in 2008, and uh, well, I should say I started in 2008 because that's when I really needed it. And I think it was maybe three or four years of trial and error, tweaking the sound. Um, I made this shell and this neck to start with, and those are two original pieces still here. However, the way I've changed the, the bridge going into the top and the tension of the head, the material of the, of the head, the uh, bracing on the inside, all these little things have been very much a tinkering process over the years. So I wouldn't say it's been a continuous process. I pick it up and put it down sometimes for years at a time. But uh, for the last four or five years, I've been playing it pretty consistently. Put a strap on it, and now I can just uh, hold it in my hands like this. So, um, you want me to play something? Yeah, I would love. I would Let's love see. To play. Um, what should I start with? I did not. I did not prepare anything specific to play, but we can just go with. Well, you're an excellent improviser, so I'm sure that you can figure out something cool. When, when you play that instrument, uh, you usually play it standing up, but it's a, yeah. it's, a, it, it's so cool that you can actually go. I usually it play it standing up. I kind of position it to where I can be here. Sound is working. You just check this sound here. Okay, everything is coming through. Um, I'll play for you something. I'll just improvise a little bit with the bow. I made this instrument predominantly um, to achieve a sound that I could do sound like the upright bass, but also take on some of the ornamentation of the more of the sort of, well, at that time in my life, I was living in the Middle East. I was living in Egypt. Um, I was playing with a lot of musicians from all over the Middle East and West Africa. I was playing bass with Yusu Endur at the time in his project out of Senegal called the Egypt Album. And I was playing with uh, Iraqi artists and some Afghani artists and countless Egyptian artists as well. So once that bass broke in Norway and I needed a more portable instrument, I decided to make something that would also sort of sonically fit a little bit more into the world that I was into and blend a little bit more with some of the musicians and the instruments that I was working with mostly. So um, I made this instrument and I really wanted to sort of have a, uh, the chance to kind of mimic the human voice a little bit with the bow. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
just kind of making some stuff up there. I'm not exactly sure what I played. Also just warming up the fingers and the mm. strings. But in particular, I do like this instrument for using the bow because I love the upright bass for bowing. I love its kind of buzzy, deep quality. And I also like on this bass that I can just have a little bit more kind of like volume dynamic. I can be really quiet. Sounds amazing. I love your playing. I love the sound of that bass as well. Thank you. Great job. Does that bass have a name? I'm trying to make a name for it right now. The working name right now is the Arc Bass, oh. but that is uh, the working name. So check on my website, I guess, milesj.com for an update on what I will finally call this thing. But um, I have been getting some orders over the years. Uh, I have a lot of bass players asking me about it. And so as I refine it and finally get it to the state of being um, shareable, I think we're there actually this year. So I bought the wood last year to make another batch. I'm going to make it about, about a dozen this year. Some of those are claimed in orders and others are going to go out to um, people that are interested. So all that will be available. So whoever is interested, videos. like should uh, check out the link in the description of this video and get a base from you. Cool. Yes, please. I don't know about you, but I love Miles' playing and I love this instrument. It's so great and it sounds awesome in this room and it actually sounds great when it's plugged in and I heard Miles playing uh, many times and I always enjoy hearing him play. I feel that I'm always a little bit better musician after hearing him play, so it's, it's awesome. I hope that you can uh, get some of this um, amazing artistry from Miles J from the Slapstream episode as well. Uh, now I would like to know more about this bass. I don't, I don't want to go like too much into, into the specifics, uh, but it's a, such a cool instrument that uh, I, I would be curious to hear the story behind it and whatever Miles feels like sharing. And as well, if you have more questions about the bass or how to order it, you can also ask him in the live chat of this video. Or if you're watching this episode after it's been streamed, you can do that uh, by hitting the description, the link. The, you can hit the link in the description of this video and ask him whatever you want to know and maybe order a bass as well. Yeah, a little bit more story about the making of this instrument. So I told you guys how I broke my upright bass on tour and I decided I need to make one that was acoustic and full scale and portable. Um, so I was really inspired by a few instruments in particular and in particular skin topped instruments from around the world um, always kind of allured me with their sound. So. At that time, I was listening to a lot of Ganawa. So I was listening to a lot of Gimbri from Morocco or the Sentir, Gimbri or Sentir as they call it. And I was also listening to, in particular, a lot of this guy's um, Basaku Koyete from uh, Mali. I was listening to his album Segu Blue. And his album Segu Blue has basically a quartet of these instruments called Ngoni. And there's the high ones that he plays, the sort of more lead line virtuosic instrument and then they get a little bit progressively bigger into some bass ones and the sound of those bass ones on that record and generally they're very similar to the Sentir I mean the Ngoni and the Sentir are, are cousins for sure um, the the sound that I, I heard on the album was just so warm and present and like sustainy and it just felt so good as a bass tone and hearing that right at the time as I was thinking I should make a bass made me think I'm going to try to sort of start at some middle place between the upright bass and this instrument, the Ngoni or the Sintir, and kind of just try, try and find a way to sort of build an instrument that has a little bit of the properties of both. So I started on that and the first thing I did was make this shell. I made this shell out of... Uh, steam bent wood. I 
each one is many layers thick and I built this big press in order to basically form them and laminate them and then after I had made all these strips the next step was to sort of assemble them to form like a pie sort of um, shape so they all had to taper you know at their tips to form together um, that was really complicated to make <laughs> and I have a making a video that I'll be putting out shortly that sort of shows a bit more how I did that process but um, the next thing I did was I carved the neck out of a single piece of maple I used ash for the body and a simple piece of maple for the neck because I'd never built an instrument like this before and I didn't want to potentially ruin like really expensive wood um, and then the skin of course on the top is a is a cow skin or this I think this one is a cow skin but I've put on five or six skins over the years goat skins cow skins I try a lot of different things I see which ones sort of respond better to the sort of current way I have the bracing set up or I see which skin responds a little better to humidity and things and I've also learned some techniques from some different drum makers in my time around the Middle East to um, apply to the skin to sort of make it a little bit more rigid so um, it's been you could say a really long journey of learning um, as I go and kind of making up what I need to make and acquiring the skills I needed to have um, kind of along the way just because I wasn't exactly sure what I would need to do but short version of the 10 plus years I've been working on this design of this instrument is that I think I said I would take a few steps forward then a step back um, but in particular the instrument got broken many times um, I was playing a lot I was playing a lot around eastern Turkey I took it to Syria I was living in Beirut at the time and when I was playing this around in like 2000 nine ten in its first iteration and it get broken and damaged but every time it got broken I had a chance to rebuild it and because it was broken I had a chance to sort of do something a little bit different so for example the sound hole is up here because it used to be down here or in the middle I was trying those two places and once the neck was broken off in eastern Turkey and in the process of breaking the neck off it ripped this part of the skin and so I just basically, when I was putting it back together there in Turkey with like glue and crazy stuff to fix it actually in time for the gig, I just had to cut that part of the skin out and I could, I just was like, well, it's ripped and ruined there. And then I ended up liking the sound coming out of the top. So closed those holes on the bottom, made a new or stretched a new skin that had the hole up here. And, you know, that's just one of like dozens of ways that through the instrument being sort of broken or something being forcibly required to for, forcing me to require to fix it, I would have to sort of come up with some other way. So it was a lot of that kind of back and forth. Is that now your favorite spot, like to have it on top? Is that how the future base is going to be? I believe so. Yeah. Um, I put these F holes. I put the F holes in the back, too, as an experiment to see. But that was terrible. It, it looks good. <laughs> It looks good, but it was terrible. <laughs> Are you gonna keep those F holes? No, they're the... patched. They're patched with leather. They're no, purely no, no. cosmetic. But will there be like a, a part of the design from now on or not? I can't say, but the designs are pretty much on a case by case basis. If somebody wants a base from me, um, right now we're gonna pick out the wood together and the sort of the materials and the hardware and everything, you know. Oh, that's awesome. So people can your future customers can actually request some custom parts and then you can make it kind of individual for, for each customer? Yeah, the, the general idea will be that I'll have a sort of basic model that is, you know, X dollars or whatever, and then in, like upgrading different types of wood or having different types of inlays or anything you would generally get um, done extra to an instrument or swapping out different wood. I basically want to make it affordable for a wider range of people. So um, I would say that having different models sort of would allow me to do that. Because um, the main thing is, is that it's pretty rad to be able to travel and play the instrument <clears throat> and it's not so have to worry about it on the airplane. Uh, I wonder like how people react actually when they see you with that, uh, that instrument, especially, especially in all the places that you were living at in, uh, in the Middle East. Uh, people really vibrated towards it in the Middle East, you know. Um, I think it looked familiar in certain ways, and it looked, um, 
you know, relatable, I guess, to people that were interested in, in certain traditional instruments. I mean, certainly not everybody in the Middle East knows every traditional instrument there, just like we don't hear either. But for the music community that I was talking to and the different t people that I was meeting, it was definitely a conversation starter. Um, it was also a little nicer because the real full-size upright bass is a little bit louder and it can, uh, I don't know, a lot of the instruments in the Middle East can be small or thin strings or have a small soundboard. So you don't necessarily need a bass that's just like, you know. <laughs> so having a smaller instrument also kind of in terms of rehearsal in the room sometimes blended a lot better too. So, so besides the, the regular upright bass, um, what is the closest looking or sounding, mostly looking instrument that uh, you came across during your career? I say this instrument, the gimbri, and the, or the okay. sentir, or the ingoni. These, these are two words for the same instrument or another kind of very closely related instrument, but those were the closest. Although in the process of refining it, it sort of stopped being any of those instruments and it became much more of a hybrid because making this upright bass just like those instruments in terms of its uh, support didn't give me like really much sound to work with. So I had to, especially with the bow, to, to have a, like a bowable instrument was a little bit more complicated. And um, can you tell me a little bit about that piece of wood that it's on top, on top of the skin? Yeah, that's basically my equivalent to a bass bar. Okay, that's what I was guessing. I've made, I've made two dozen of those, <laughs> I promise. There, it's a very uh, interesting part of the design that I've taken on and off and experiment with. But uh, can you just like lift the instrument so that everyone can see the, the bass bar? All right. Yeah. It's all cool. I I, I love it. Um, I would love to hear you play a little bit more. Like, uh, and I know that you're an excellent slapper as well. Uh, can you kind slap of. that thing a little bit? I can try. This is Slapstream after all. Yes. Um, coming from one of the most exciting slap bass players in the world, I'm thrilled you're asking me to play some slap bass <laughs> for you. Never thought. Um, my, uh, yeah, my journey with slap bass is a little bit interesting because for those of you that don't know, I now play in a band with Fabrice, the violinist that George a played with in Fish Tank for 10 years. So a lot of what I've sort of developed in my own weird slap technique is geared towards like sort of merging better in that band with Fabrice, our violinist and Dusty, our guitar player. Um, so, and there's also like, obviously George's massive history with Fabrice. So um, my slap technique is kind of a little bit, I would say it was more like it came out of that environment than it was me really looking to create or, or become a slap bass player but a lot of things in life for me musically have come kind of out of having a musical relationship with somebody that then inspires or challenges me to play a certain way so um let's see i guess i'll just groove a little bit yeah sounds good
my favorite grooves are those in odd time signatures. And you play nine eights, right? I do. I like to play. I love to slap stuff actually for the odd time signatures the most. Yeah, that's that's the bad. You you just played it in nine, right? Yeah, I just switched to nine on the spot. All Missed right. up. But the nine is cool because the or the nine and the sevens and fives all give you a chance. Like, a, I mean, like a, we have a song in five that's kind of like. combinations of two and three beat rhythm groups and all the odd meters give you these funny little ways to sort of kind of flip or or play with those twos and threes and with a single or a double slap kind of filling in the holes in different ways is really fun and we haven't mentioned the name of your band it's axon orchestra right yeah um, i'm in a band called axon orchestra yep and uh, what does what does that mean who came up with that name? Axon Orchestra was a name that my brother came up with, actually, because the band was, it started as a much larger band, and Axon, the, so the Axon is the end of a nerve cell, cell, the long tail of a nerve cell that basically connects with the next one. And as I understand it, any single Axon connect to, can connect in effect to thousands of other nerve cells or at least connect to enough to make thousands of possible connections or combinations of connections. And so we picked that name because we just liked the sort of circumstances of the way this band came together. Um, Axon Orchestra was originally created to play at Burning Man with, um, for a, a wonderful hotel that we still play at almost every Saturday called the Petit Hermitage Hotel in West Hollywood. And we had put an eight piece band together and they wanted this ensemble to sort of be able to tap into a lot of different music traditions. And we had in our community of friends and musicians, sort of all of that, but we all came from kind of slightly different backgrounds or slightly different concentric circles, you could say. So Axon Orchestra also kind of just related a bit to all the different community members or scenes that sort of were part of our musical communal circle and then the band growing kind of out of that conversation. I love Petit Hermitage. We started playing, Fabrice and me started playing as a fish tank ensemble. Or oh, it was some other project, but I remember it was for the first time we both played there. It was together. Yeah. It gotta be, I don't know, 15, 16 years ago or so. It was during fish tank ensemble days, but I forgot if it was really a fish tank or something. I think that a friend of ours uh, invited us in. And still wonderful, wonderful place. I love coming there, especially like to hear you guys play. And it's I highly recommend Petit Hermitage in West Hollywood, on Cynthia Street, right? Yep, Cynthia Street. It's yeah, it's one of the coolest rooftops in LA, in my opinion. I would like to ask Miles about his slap technique now, and uh, that you know that's the main reason why I'm doing these slap streams because I wanna learn more and I want to improve more and I want to present uh, great slap bass players like Miles. So I would like to know when did you discover it? How did you discover slap bass first? Slap bass was high school, Reverend Horton Heat for sure, Living End. Um, kind of those two bands when I was like in high school, hardcore bands and stuff, I was just blown away by, by those bass techniques. But I didn't actually ever really think, I don't know, I never, I was playing electric bass in those bands oh, at the time, okay. so it was like, it was cool, but I hadn't quite become an upright player yet. So. And so kind of the main influence as, at that time was rockabilly and psychobilly, but then you never got into playing those genres? Yeah, because I, I got into playing jazz and more like swing music, and then I got way into Middle Eastern music and moved to the Middle East for like 15 years. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I know you've been there like for a long time. I didn't know you were there like for 15 years. It was like 10 years of pretty much continuous, but it's been about 15 years of working. And uh, that's great. I mean, I can hear that in your relationship. I can hear that in your in your music and in your playing. And it's you did the right thing. 
That's great. Um, all right, so I would like you to demonstrate uh, different slap patterns that you play, and I also want to know how do you name them? Do you usually you uh, use that uh, uh, traditional way of naming patterns like a single slap, double slap, triple slap, that type of thing, or you have your own your own thing? I think I have my own thing because I. I don't exactly have an official slap thing, but okay. this is good because you'll tell me also <laughs> what's what. I'm um, trying to make it like more uh, uniform so that, you know, for the future people can, you know, communicate and then uh, know what I mean when they talk about single slap, double slap, triple or whatever. And um, I want to I want to pick everyone's brain, you know, and then ask like what people um, consider a single slap or a double slap or whatever you use. I'm, I'm now I'm interested to hear what is your way of uh, teaching slap bass and then like what are all the different patterns that you use. <laughs> okay, well it's a little, it's not exactly organized in my mind either. I could do that. I could talk about bow stuff in that way because that's what I think about a little more. But with the slap, I do have a single. I do have a double. I'm attempting to learn the triple that okay. you showed so, me last So week. what is the single slap for you? I mean, the single slap for me, well, the main thing is that I try to do with, and I'm sure a lot of people have already talked about this, but um, I try to sort of blend the mix between slap and like note. So like the most basic slap is kind of just going to be like a backbeat and I'm going to just like pluck the string warmly. So I... The, the sort of next single slap would have like an actual like and then a kind of thing but the sort of double slap I have I think is I don't know if people do this normally but it's a sort of a thumb hand thing. okay so like a I got it. So my my question is basically when you when you call something uh, a slap, you would always call it this part. You would not count the the this and and you would not count both the slap of the string oh, that's and a good palm. That's so a good question. you would you would just count the palm? No, I guess not because I have some other. I also play it kind of a style like like we have another song in Axel the orchestra. slap bass so okay yeah, yeah i agree with slap, that yeah. even though the slap is the backbeat so i guess if i'm doing i would just call this i guess walking it's it's slap if you if you snap the string I guess. okay right so or what would be a single mind. slap for you all right good and double slap okay so for double slap you would count only the slaps of your fingers but for the single slap you would count uh the slap of the string am i understanding correctly i never thought about it but ah, okay, you tell right. me you tell so, me i mean i can tell you what i the, the ask way me in i the chat. ask me in the chat how, yeah how do you do it <laughs> tell me i don't have any way of right. talking about yeah, this like, give me give me your your instrument for a second oh, so okay. i can tell you so for me i'll try to do this it's not what i'm used to it but I guess like this so for me the sl a single slap would be just this okay. okay so when it's a I count both slap of the string and the fingers mm -hmm. so double would be ah. oh okay so we're one number off I gotcha. so I would count everything so you know so all the slaps I mean um, triple would be as a gallop like this or triplet and then the same quadruple and then like more complex patterns like I don't know whatever that's the one i like yeah. <laughs> that's the one i have so that's the next one i want to learn from you but this is 
Well, this episode is about Miles. No, no, Georgie. So, um, well, you're a big inspiration for this stuff. So, all right, thank you. Um, so, so yeah. yeah, getting back to that, then I would say my triple slap. I don't do like. Okay. I should learn how to do that. I do. Oh yeah, yeah. So you my always do. Yeah, like the main groove we play. That's just sort of like the. But but main. if you don't play rumba, if you if we don't do mm -hmm. like three three two, if you if you play just something that has like uh, triplets. Well, here I've, there's a Middle East, a Middle Eastern like a uh, heavy rhythm that we play for one Egyptian song we play that's kind of like a. Or triplets? You mean like how do I? How would I do like a, uh, like, like that? That little thing. Or oh, the one that we were talking the, the, uh, the uh, last week. Uh, that will be quadruple. I mean, I guess like that. But um, if we're t you're talking like playing like six eight, like yeah, like that. And do you use a thumb for that? I don't know. I don't really play. I don't ever really ever play. If I play six eight slap, I'll play it more like a. Uh, wait. I guess yeah. I um. Well, actually, when I play fast triplets, I kind of cheat with. If it's an open string, and then I, I basically slip. I'll slip. I'll switch to like just a whatever one did it, did it, did it kind of sound. But for the fast triplet thing, I don't know if I exactly have a style yet because so, I don't play so much. So when do you when do you start using a thumb? At what point? I start using my thumb. I guess. Uh, more straight du duple time stuff. So if I if I'm like, like you would play this like that, right? Uh, either or, but yeah, most of that. I would say I use the thumb anytime there's like two, uh, but it's not a triplet. Got it's it. A, right. So when you have a two two slaps before the note, when you have two slaps be plus the note, that's when you would use a a thumb. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And uh, any other patterns that you use? Uh, um, uh, let's see. Well, I guess just kind of like I, I'm trying to sort of like just have a backbeat that I can have with finger style stuff that's there. And I'm trying to sort of learn how to play it like as I strike a note. I don't know if this is something that you do. You probably have a trick for this, but like that bass line I was showing you at the beginning from mm -hmm. our song. Uh, uh, to do that, to do that, that last, there's a note and a slap at the same mm -hmm. time. So I'm trying to go like. Ah, oh, I got it. And I don't know if that's if that's a thing people do, but it just, I wanted that. Is that something that you ever do? Of sort of. I don't, but I I'm, I get what you want to do. You basically want to have like a, 
want to have that warm like piccato sound, but I like also have the the slap of the. Um, I want like that back beat, so it's kind of sort of like a little a little bit of drums are built in. Got it. Because if I go. Hard to sort of know where the rhythm is in it, but but that's hard. It's hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's cool. It's a cool thing. So, but let's get back to the uh, regular slap. So you would do. I heard when you play odd time signatures. So let's do. Like a seven. seven or nine, eleven, whatever you're the most comfortable with. Um, maybe, uh, what should we start with a seven? Sure. Like two, two, three? Yeah. Uh, so let's see. So, I mean, if we're. I switched to nine. <laughs> I don't know why my head's a you nine. Want me to do it? Come on. <laughs> why? I think no. I think not with the clap. Let me just think the song in seven. It's nine. Nine game. Yeah. I guess I live in nine in my head. <laughs> Let's start in nine then. Since All right. We're there, then we'll switch to seven. So. Um, Yeah, a basic, I like leaving a lot of space in nine, but. That would be the kind of a little. From nine, I mix the twos like that. If we were gonna go into like a seven, like a... Because I don't, I don't necessarily think about it so specifically. No, I, I like, just like try to mix twos and threes in funny ways and play with the time. Sure, I like the the way you approach them. I just wanted you to demonstrate. So, yeah. since I believe you have a unique style with the slap bass. Is this is the using the thumb a normal style in slap? Uh, I would say it is normal, but it's not the most common. Okay. But everybody has their own thing, you know. Yeah. I use thumb fairly often but not for the basic slab figures. Yeah, because you've got the... Yeah, so, but I use it for some rolls and uh, like more complex grooves. Like usually for, for seven and nines, I would not use it. For Sometimes okay. if, I ha if I want an extra ornament. Mm. No. I like, yeah, I just, I love odd rhythms and the slap thing. It's just, I don't know, just something. I mean, even if we were to just flip like the two in like a nine, for example, like if we're starting with like a two, 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 three. I'm, I'm putting those and all this sort of. Yep. So for anybody that's not counting nines in a regular part of their daily life, we usually count odd rhythms and subdivisions of twos and threes. 
so we're thinking of this nine as a two, 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 three. So I'll play those twos with a one, two, 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 one, two. And then I'll play the three probably just with a, just like a slower slide. Oh, so you would use that. So you, you would use it as a regular triplet without a thumb. I don't know. I, I, I mean, I'm, you're, you're right. Yeah, that okay. happens. <laughs> I don't exactly know what I do because, again, you're the first person to ask me. But um, I could do, I could do, do that too this way. fun to make that nine into three groups of three instead of the two 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 three so sounds great um, one tip if you want to count nine you can do that one two one two one two one two three or you can do taco 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 burrito taco 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 mm, burrito classic classic well um i always have three tacos with my burrito so all right <laughs> you can also do one taco one enchilada one burrito or taco do, enchilada burrito or one. burrito 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 <laughs> well <laughs> we will get into six eights then okay right? yeah <laughs> too many burritos okay cool um any other slap patterns that you would like to mention or I wish I had more to offer the slap world but at the moment this is where I'm no, at. this is great but this, this is, is a lot um, you know I love it it's awesome thank you I uh, I would like to hear you play a little bit more more slap now so, so we can finish this slap section let's see what uh, let's see what should I play in slap I kind of just played a bunch of slap stuff is there more to hear? Oh yeah, let me just scoop back a little bit. slapping um, I would like to ask you a little bit about your preference on the strings pickups uh, the bow and all of that so what are these strings 
<laughs> you asked me that just because you know I don't know what these strings are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh yeah, yeah, you mentioned that. Sorry, sorry. I don't know what these strings sorry. are, but there's a wonderful shop, fantastic musical instruments near my house in Pasadena, and the owner of that shop had these used, and he let me try them out, and I loved them. I actually bought a different set for these are a synthetic core, and um, I will find out from him what they are, and put that in the uh, in the description or whatever. As far as pickups go. I am, like, I'm not the Mr. Bass Tech Gear Savvy guy, weirdly enough, um, I should be. Um, I play with the David Gage pickup right now. I have a Realist in this one, and I've had a Realist on my upright for years. Um, but for all the years I was switching the first Realist between this bass and my regular bass, they broke. So I switched, I used a K and K pickup, just the simple single um, mounts under the wing of the bridge i used that k and k for years which was fine but not really that interesting and then last year i got this new realist which i really like on this bass and on my upright i have actually a shadow rockabilly pickup with like a slap contact mic and then also a piezo underneath the um <clears throat> underneath the bridge wing uh the f the other main pickup i've used in my life is uh this mystery pickup I can show you right here. Pickups. I love this pickup and I don't know what it is, but I got it in Belgium. It's like a magnetic guy. It's a magnetic pickup. And I built this little wooden thing to basically mount it to the bottom, but it's got four magnetic transducers. I think that's a Schaller. Schaller. Is this a Schaller? Schaller magnetic pickup, yep. Okay. Looks well, like it. I got it without a box. I bought it from a shop used, and I used that for years too, but I never knew what it was, so a Schaller. Um, that's, about, that's about everything I can say. As far as heads, though, and amplifiers go, I have a Mesa Boogie D180, I mean, pardon me, a D800, Subway 800, and uh, that's just incredible with this instrument and generally with any upright because of that voice voicing knob really adds a lot of presence or takes away what you don't want so you do play a regular upright bass as well right yeah i see several of them here mm -hmm. <laughs> what are these uh upright bases uh this is the upright bass that i bought in muscat oman i bought that i was playing in oman a gig with this oud player nasir shama and I, this was the bass that they rented for me, and it showed up like this in the back of a pickup truck. And even though it was really hammered on the fingerboard and in the front, the actual bass itself was in great shape. And I made the guy an offer, actually, when, <laughs> when I had to return it after the gig. And he was like, okay, great. So I got it. I bought it from him for not really that much money. It was in pretty bad shape. And then I had to ship it back to Beirut, Lebanon in the cardboard boxes. Like, so I, I bought this base and I suddenly had a base in Oman that I had to get to Lebanon with no case. And I had like 10 hours before my flight. So I sort of made elbow pads for out of cardboard boxes and just prayed. And it actually made it back okay. And I used this base in Lebanon for years. And um, I don't use it so much now. Um, one of my good friends and students, Ezra, is using it right now. But he, I borrowed it for some uh, soundtrack recordings recently so and then this base is this is this cool road ear that I've been lucky enough to use um, by the grace and kindness of my family friend Don Don Meyer um, so she's been loaning me this bass for 20 years now. It's belonged to her father, uh, Bob Meyer. He played it in these bands, Les Paul's band and Doc Severinsen's band. And uh, it's a Kansas City bass from 19, uh, 1908, sort of. Bird's Eye Maple. Um, I've got a few pieces of cardboard in here because it has been opening up terribly with cracks. Um, over the last couple of years and every time I get cracks fixed on it I have to get them fixed again or I just fix them myself and maybe 
sometimes I don't do that great of a job or something, but uh, although, yeah, it really is kind of coming apart, but this bass sounds great. And this loud one. So do this do, is what I grew up on playing. Do you do luthier work on uh, you know, regular operate basses as well? Uh, I do for myself and I do for my friends, but I wouldn't call myself like, uh, don't don't ask me to send me a bass if that's what you're thinking, because I could do it like, you know, I'm very careful. I make a bunch of stuff out of wood, but I haven't been trained by like luthiers. So for instruments that are like historic or made in a very specific way, with specific repair techniques, I wouldn't necessarily be the guy to go for, at least right now. But I'm learning. I'm learning, so talk to me in a couple of years. <laughs> Is that one of your goals, like to learn how to do proper, I mean, I'm not saying that this is not proper, but like like for regular, upright, bass, luthier work? Uh, you know, maybe, maybe. I think though I'm, I'm, um, I don't think I'm going to be. I don't think I'm going to be learning the classical tradition of instrument making, though, at least in this lifetime, because I'm into my guerrilla style of instrument making, and I'm also uh, there's a bunch of people already doing those instruments really, really well, and at this point, I'm just focusing on trying to learn how to play all these instruments. I am going to put the back on this cello back on though, because I just got this cello. Um, I'll show you one other one. Here's a little mini guy that I made sort of looks similar to that. This is an Ethiopian Masenko, but it's got a little skin. It's a one string horsehair fiddle. And I made the box just out of like random scrap maple and teak that I had gotten um, dumpster diving job sites around LA actually, because you can get a lot of crazy wood at mansions getting decks put on. This is... <laughs> Masenko, Ethiopia. So cool. I love that thing. <laughs> Any other instruments here that you built? Uh, no more that I built built that are here. I've only really made um. I've only really made it focused on making the space and then trying to make it actually sound good. Uh, that Masenko I made as well because I needed one. But the rest of the instruments here are generally instruments that I've picked up, and everything actually that I play. Interestingly, I've learned to play through playing bass for that an artist on that instrument. So I play a lot of bazookis and bazooks because um, I, I was lucky enough to back up uh, Dr. A.J. Rossi at UCLA on bazook for some years and um, even Ziad Rahbani in Lebanon on bazook. I play lira, Cretan lira. This is this gorgeous little... Can you demonstrate a little bit? Sure. Please. I was practicing it, so it's got a giant cello mute on it. Um. This instrument you play with your fingernails so you don't actually push the string down you just put your fingernails next to the strings so it's kind of uh, it's it's like a three string very short violin but So I play Lyra because I was, I mean, I play Lyra more as a composer and as a writer than I do as a performer, but I play it because I was playing bass for Ross Daly, this great Lyra player, and his wife Kelly Thomas for a bunch of years. Um, 
And so I pick that up. And generally all these other harps and unique instruments from the Middle East and East Africa all come from the time when I was a music director for the Nile Project, which was a collective of musicians from all the n countries of the Nile River Basin. And so that was doing that for about five years. And in that period of time, um, in conjunction with sort of, sort of directing the residencies and some of the creative processes that the music's, musicians did to create the music for the program and for the project and tours and stuff, I was also trying to get as many instruments to sort of just get my hands on and understand a little better how they felt and how they behaved and, and maybe have some spontaneous ideas for how to use them. And so over years and years of working with a lot of those artists, I was able to pick up some really cool ones like um, for bass players will like this. Hopefully it's in tune. But this is called the Ananga. It's from Rwanda. And there was this amazing woman there, Sophie Nizai Senga, that um, played this in our project. And she gave me this one and a couple of the others too. So. Oh, geez. <laughs> We're not even on planet Ananga right now. This is. Anyway, this one is a, also a love of mine from that era. So, and then I play also for the bass players. This is a Syrian bouzouk. I got this in Aleppo uh, in 2009. Um, it's not a very fancy instrument, but it's a great instrument. And I have strung it uh, low strung, so it's strung like... Um, an octave lower than normal. Don't see my regular pick here, but I'll just show you. Is it called the way to play? No. So yeah, basically the normal way these are strung is like this one, which is, oh, there's my pick. <laughs> there it is. quite high, you know. And this one, I strung down the low, and so it's got this just... on this too. So this is one of my favorite instruments to play and it's through the amplifier, especially since I put these two humbuckers on it and a little sort of push-pull toggle switch, um, I think sounds massive through a bass amp. How about that saws over there? Saws, the electric saws? Yeah. This is this is amazing, but this is uh, electric only, so I'd have to plug it in. But yeah, this is this is great. I um, played. A wedding in Eastern Turkey years and years ago, one of the first gigs on that bass, and there was a Kurdish band. Um, this guy Hozam Muzaffer and his saz player Bismili Cheto, and that was one of the. F they were playing a like a three day wedding right next to where we were playing in Diyarbakir, Turkey, very Kurdish area of Turkey, and these are, this is a Kurdish band. But the Kurdish style on that instrument is so mental. So I um. I was ever since then I was dreaming about getting one of those and I just got that a couple of years ago when I was back going through Turkey for something else. So And I know you play that sometimes with Fabrice, so Yeah. And you sound great. Thank you. That's awesome. Is there anything else from the gear that you would like to mention? Like do you use any pedals or 
anything like that besides mm. the amps you mentioned? I don't really. With the bass. Yeah, with the bass. Um, sometimes I like to use the Pog, Pog octave pedal for this bass because it's so clean and it can really get that octave. Um, I uh, yeah, sometimes a little compressor, but generally though, no, I generally don't really run too many pedals. I mean. I have in the past had a lot of pedals on stage, but when I'm like, um, I don't know, sometimes I find that they're a little bit more distracting, at least depending on the gig. So yeah, for certain gigs, I would have to have pedals and I would love to have pedals, but for Axon Orchestra, it's kind of, it's cool with pedals, but it's also very cool without, at least for the bass, the violin and guitar, they use a lot of effects, but for the bass and the upright bass in particular, it's kind of fine. So. No, I don't usually generally use too many things. Carl Martin compressor sometimes, but... As far as the recordings go, like which ones would you say that represent your bass playing and more specifically your slab bass playing the most? <laughs> None. <laughs> There's what? literally no recording of me playing slap bass. I'm serious. I don't play slap on the, on the album. Why? Because I didn't... Well, I don't know. I don't think... I didn't really do that that much then. I mean, I guess that was just last year. But I've only been sort of trying to play slap for like a couple of years now. And, but I do notice when we were making our record with our band Axon, like this, we were doing it ourselves, and we were getting too much slap and not enough bass note. And so we just kind of did it without, without that. But I have um, a lot of music that I've been writing and a lot of music that I'm releasing probably in the beginning of May or the beginning of June that does feature a lot of those techniques. And um, and I figured out a better way to basically record it to where I could get enough kind of low end and stuff. But yeah, not a lot of slap recordings for me, unfortunately. So have you already started recording that? Yeah, lots and lots of it. Huh? So what is, a, what is your favorite way to record slap bass? My favorite way to record slap? Well, it's a combination. I run my pickup through my bass head. Um, I put basically, this uh well the sm7b that you're talking through the sure mic i put up close and then basically close to my sound hole on either base actually even if i'm recording on the regular upright i'll still put it a sort of a, a dynamic mic close to the sound hole and then i'll put a condenser like this one a little bit away and you know i'm maybe there's some <laughs> secret tricks mid side technique or something that i could do but at least that way i have a little bit of the different pieces in somewhat discreteness so i have the line signal from the from the pickup i have the dynamic mic for the more close range bass tone and i have the condenser mic for an overall picture and a little bit more of the high pitch slap stuff yeah i feel you have to have uh several sources when you record Base right. separately, se uh, especially slap right. base. <laughs> that looks better, huh? Um, so yeah, that's that's how I like recording as well. At least two or three tracks would be bass, especially if you do slap bass. Um, do you have a specific way to write your bass lines? I love your bass lines, and I would be interested to hear how do you have an, an, a special approach? How do you create them uh well thank you i love your bass lines too um i uh i do a lot of writing on non-bass instruments so i write a lot on what you see behind me and I, i'm inspired by that a lot and it's you know i have this i have actually I have a solo record of music primarily for bass uh lira and buzuk um, so a lot of the bass lines that I kind of write for my own music come a little bit through finding a way to sort of support some of these instruments. In Axon Orchestra or other bands I'm in, I wouldn't say there's really a, a way, but I, I do have this idea that sort of every kind of rhythmic ecosystem kind of has its sort of nucleus and it's kind of orbiting outer parts in terms of like relevance to the feel. and. The bass, it's so interesting because like certain music, the bass is so on the beat, um, like the rumba kind of stuff and a lot of this Balkan and other things, you know, I'm playing a lot of one and three and then 
obviously swing music is kicking that back to the two and four a little bit, but then straight Latin music or tumbao feel where you're not even playing anything on one is to me like kind of getting more and more into that interesting realm where the bass can do so much with so few notes and it's like finding the right place for the sort of right note or the right accent or something can kind of free up a bunch of space other places in terms of the bar or the feel or the measure or whatever so I usually just try to look and find like what's the sort of the epicenter of the groove and how can I outline that um, as simply as possible because actually when I'm playing with an ensemble I, I play much more simply you know I really love like simple groovy bass lines and just hard hitting stuff like that but I'd say those are the two things I try to find the epicenter of the groove or the sort of nucleus of the groove and then find out how I can kind of dress it up or push and pull on the expectations of the audience or the band um, by playing with that that particular note or space within the within the rhythm I know that you write lots of music and how important bass is as part of your original music um bass is real important for my original music i mean i write melodies and i i write um i've done a number of documentary film scores and i even just did a lot of the music for peaky blinders season six um you'll hear this bass all over it um fabrice and i just finished recording a lot of strings for that a couple of weeks ago um but generally my writing style when it comes to whether it's film music soundtrack or whatnot is being a bass player and thinking like a bass player i find it's very interesting and sort of grounding and sort of a little bit more predictable to kind of start with a little bit of movement in the bass or i wouldn't even say a bass line but let's just say movement and then it's kind of i throw something on top of that and then oftentimes i'll completely take the old the first bass line out and then I'll sort of try to find the bass movement that works to that new high part. And a lot of times my writing style personally involves sort of putting one foot of bass down and then a foot of melody down and then a foot of bass down and melody. And each step is kind of informing what's before it and after it a little bit until I feel like there's, I don't know, an aesthetic kind of balance that I like. But I'm very much into tinkering and I just... I just also just try stuff out and bang my head against the keyboard or the wall until until something good happens and sometimes it's in five minutes and sometimes it's in three hours you know so there's never any prediction to that but um how do i make bass lines all in all if i'm making bass for an ensemble the simpler and groovier the better generally i try to find and then i put the heat and the spice in in the right places and um try to have that supportive thing going on who would you say were the biggest bass influences on you? Um, biggest bass influences on me? Well, for sure, Charlie Mingus. One of my favorite composers, one of my favorite bass players, um, music educators. He had such a rich life and did so many things and really had such an adventurous sound on whatever he, he picked up, you know, um, but I loved his band and so yeah playing wise and sound wise I, I love Mingus. I spent a long time listening to Scott LaFaro of course um, I you know Ray Brown, Ron Carter, or Eddie Gomez these are people that I, I love and admire um, I also in my electrical life, electric bass life, my electrical life <laughs> I've definitely influenced a lot with Jamie Jameson, Stanley Clark um, uh and my dad you know my dad steve J. <laughs> definitely in terms of bass aesthetic goes and as far as uh, slap bass players are there any that that you can choose i close? mean yeah <laughs> i'll say you man <laughs> I, mean, I mean yeah and that's not actually just to just for me to stoke out my buddy here but no really when i first heard george a play i came back i saw you guys in san diego at basilio's property i would just come back from egypt i had not heard you yet and i just heard about fish tank and i was that was singularly one of the nights i remember of my life of watching somebody just do something on bass i never even thought was possible and not just in a flashy fireworks kind of way but actually in a supporting the band 
and being the drummer kind of relentless groove sort of way so no you're definitely uh my one of my musical uh musical slap heroes <laughs> thank you be honored um, do you have any advice like how to get a gig? You know, I think that these, I love asking this question because I had a different rage and different age of my guests uh, during the slap stream. And it's, it's kind of interesting, you know, like all the people have like one approach that kind of doesn't work now. And then younger people to completely have a different advice. So what would be your advice? What would be your suggestion? How do younger <laughs> bass players, they want to get a gig, they want to be more involved in music business, how, how, would, how should they start? What should they do? Young bass players, all bass players, we're all, we're all looking for gigs. Um, what should you do to start? Well, uh, that's very personal to what you like about music so you gotta you probably want to start in the scene that you're into obviously the genre the style of music that you like every style of music has a totally different way of its sort of business side working you know my brother's wife worked in country radio country music and radio for 10 years and it was a completely different world than anything i, I worked in so if you're into country music or you're living in nashville versus la or new york those are kind of different music cultures in terms of the way the business works so that will affect I think sort of how you move through those landscapes and everything but as far as getting an actual gig and everything goes with that um, the way it's worked for me is I generally try to do good on gigs and try to stoke out the people that I'm working for and playing for and supporting and I usually try to get a gig off of that gig you know a good gig is a good is a gig where another gig comes from it um, and I have dedicated a lot of my life to and practice time to being a quick memorizer and a quick study that's also I think a good tip in how to get a gig is people are gonna teach you their songs obviously and they're gonna sort of you know want you to be able to interact and sort of get off the ground with it fairly quick and have some interpretations and that ear training and literally just learning songs when you're home practicing versus practicing like kind of just on your own can be a really helpful way to actually just strengthen that ability to like learn and retain chord changes and hits and stuff because the main thing you don't want to miss are chords and hits right as a bass player then you're totally out in the cold everybody knows you did it and you're like a giant hole in the dance floor so those are the main things to remember to kind of keep the gig um but also i think in the Generally, in terms of being a bass player, it's also, you know, this we're not just sort of the foundation in the music is kind of like a, I don't know, there's something about just bass players being supportive. I feel like, you know, whatever band or artist you're working with, whether you're trying to get a gig with an orchestra or audition to for something or a, or get a gig, answer an audition for a band call in local listings or whatever. Really, I mean, what I find I'm looking for in musicians I work with is somebody that I can really have a great time with and function with both on the stage and off the stage. Um, what makes music exciting for me is playing with my friends, it being personal and a connection builder and a way to also get to know people. I love, I played music and worked around the world for so many years. And I think what kept me doing that longer was because it was a way to get to know the world and get to know people around me. So also getting the gig is a big part about just, you know, the hang and, and being like, you know, open to different types of conversation, open to different things. I, that might not seem like what you should, what you would think, but really I feel like the gigs that matter, the gigs that you want to keep, that is not just like, I got a wedding this weekend with a bunch of people I don't know, but like I got a cool gig with these really interesting musicians who do this and they hit me this way emotionally or they push me this way intellectually or they challenge me this way physically or whatever. It's the good gig is the gig where you have a chance to grow in the space of that gig and that gig pulls the talent out of you maybe that you didn't know you had or that you have um, been looking to sort of strengthen and um, 
So once you got that gig, putting all your heart and all your energy into it and all of your uh, ability to sort of learn and grow from the situation too is, is as much a part of it. So those are little things I would suggest. Do you have any advice uh, and especially pointing out like common mistakes that you see that other bass players do during their careers or especially when they start? Um, interesting question. Common mistakes other bass players do. Well, let's see. I could tell you about the mistakes I've made. Um, uh, the mistakes I feel like I made in my younger years were um, not realizing sometimes how how important sort of specific creative directions were. So when I was like 25, 26, working with different musicians in different places, and they would tell me different things. It was, it was, I didn't exactly have yet my radar sharpened to read what was a sort of a suggestion for interpretation versus a suggestion for like this way every time, all the time. Um, so I feel like as a bass player, we are finding and walking that line between being expressive for ourselves and supporting the expression of an entire band. And so for sure, we overplay or do too much or just fill in too much kind of sonic space. That's going to actually like detract from the overall expressiveness of the band or just get in other people's ways or just kind of make it a bummer because a really busy bass player is in the wrong time is like also really, I don't know, not my jam personally. So, um, I feel like the main mistake that a bass player could make is to bring a little bit too much of what you have to say onto stage without necessarily leaving enough space to listen to what your bandmates have to say. And my favorite bass players are the ones that put the sweet fill like tastefully, a few notes right in the right place. and it pops out in like 3d and then it's like whoa like that was there this whole time but it's like you just saw a flash of it like through the trees or something and then you know you find yourself as a musician or at least as a bass player kind of waiting when's the next one going to come but the bass player is not like giving it to you because he's holding down the dance floor and making space for the rest of the band and supporting whatever is happening but then when the next moment comes for there to be something whether it's just a little gliss or a little pop or a slap or a snap or whatever it's like Oh, you know, you feel like in those two isolated and independent moments in the song, there's there is a correlation. And those are my favorite moments in bass playing. My least favorite moments in music are when you hear a bass player that's trying to sort of like show that. And I've been there myself at different stages, but you hear a bass player that's trying to like prove either to themselves or to their band or to the whole world, like what they can play. And that's the tricky thing. Like we prove ourselves as bass players to the world by playing less, I feel, and by playing more tastefully and selectively because the bass can quickly overwhelm the, <laughs> the foundation of, of a band and of a frequency of an ensemble. And um, we have that sort of unique role where we have a personality to offer, but that personality comes out best when it is in service to others. It's a great way to <laughs> explain in our role in the world, <laughs> the band world. Is there anything that you would recommend for fellow bass players to practice on everyday bass? Yeah, well, there's a, I mean, a, a few things. I mean, I could talk about a lot of practice stuff because I really enjoy practicing. And okay, so I just started watching uh, some videos from Corey Wong from. Uh, from uh, Wolfpack, the guitar player for Wolfpack, and he was talking about one of his exercises, one of his basic exercises, which is like a sort of just like eighth notes up and down on a guitar. And then he was talking about, which I'm sure you've heard from many other people, having the metronome on quarter notes, then eighth notes, I mean, quarter notes, then just half notes, and then just like one on the whole note, and trying to maintain that feel all the way through. And, you know, I've heard that from a few people, but the way, well, first of all, that guy's feel, but also the way that that technique actually works. If you're a bass player and you haven't tried that, it might seem like silly, but I highly recommend it. It involves like setting your digital metronome or your like drum sequencer or whatever with 
hits on every quarter note, and then remove quarter notes three, two, and four, so you have just one and three, and then remove quarter note three again a little bit later, so you just have one, so it'll be one. And you're playing through that gap. Playing through that gap teaches you how to gauge like time on the long term. It teaches you how to sort of like make up time in a little bit. I mean, you'd be crazy surprised at how many things you can pick up on when you're actually trying to like anticipate a beat that's like coming in a few seconds and you're playing eighth notes or whatever, or just resting. But whatever it is, I find that if I have my metronome set in a way where there's long gaps between it, and then I practice basically going from different feels like half time to regular time to double time or into triplet time and I'm simultaneously like switching my my feels as I'm trying to like bridge these gaps in the metronome man that is gangbusters practice that like tunes your brain and your mentality and your ability to kind of like because you know when we go to halftime we tend to slow down or we think we're going to slow down so we're going to rush so then we tend to rush same when we go to double time we tend to rush unless we're already thinking oh it's double time i don't want to rush then we might actually play a little too slow um if you have your metronome going tick 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 and you practice those things you never really know how much of it is you and how much of it is the metronome whereas that slow metronome changing feels bullseye and that Corey wong video is is really cool he talks about it um in in terms of uh rhythm guitar playing uh, other things I would just say about practicing bass are tone, you know. Um, it's really easy to practice bass and focus, or practice any instrument and focus on what we love about what we're doing. And most of the time it's the exciting riff that we're trying to play or getting close to being able to achieve or whatever. And um, I find that on all my instruments, if I really keep my focus in my ear and everything on the tone of what I'm doing, that kind of tone and that quality of tone sort of guides the, my whole kind of practice session. In other words, if I'm playing something a little faster or articulately than I like, but the tone is starting to suffer, then it doesn't really totally count because ultimately like that tone is, is like the meal, you know, that's what, that's what you're serving and what you're doing with it is how it's sort of dressed up. But if we try to achieve things that are kind of sacrificing our tone or, or changing our tone in a way that we're not actually trying to do or not even aware of, then that's another thing I like to really be mindful of. So my tone, my feel, and then if you're playing upright bass, intonation, yeah, there it is, intonation. It's your best friend. I would practice fifths and octaves all up and down the neck and then uh, go from there into the smaller ones. I'll leave it at that, but I have a few practice things too on my um, outlets and stuff that I can share more of. So, and uh, for somebody that would like to get into world music, especially from um, from where we live, from the Western world, how would you? Is there any recommendation on that field? Well, Georgia's Danube River tours are fantastic. I highly recommend them. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, getting into world music. Uh, well, first of all, what is world music? It's a whole world of music, so it's all different. So there's no real such thing as world music. Um, but you'll find in your town or wherever you live that there's various music scenes. And some of those scenes might be foreign to your area or some of those scenes might be baked in slowly over time. But um, getting to know that community is a really big part of it. Now, let's just say you don't have access to a community and people to immediately play with, but you want to explore world music again um i'm sure you can figure out how to do that online yourself but once you find it is that you like what let's say you're exploring world music and you really get into like you know ali akbar khan sarod playing well then that you know focusing in on on what is in that scene and who maybe is around that's available to sort of participate uh universities oftentimes have indian music gamelan music uh turkish music Middle Eastern music. Oh, and I haven't even given a shout out to my university, which was UC Santa Barbara. And my professor, Scott Marcus, who the day he introduced Middle Eastern music to me changed my life. I studied Arabic language and I spent years and decades out in that part of the world and have some of my best friends in the world, um, in Egypt and Lebanon and Syria and all over the place out there. So um, 
I got into world music through my dad who had created this atmosphere of music from around the world in, in my home space with my family and then through Scott who sort of took all that charged energy and focused it into Arabic music you know I was studying some Indian music and I was studying some other things too at that time but when I really found Arabic music I found a way to focus it and then within that Arabic music sort of passion I found an interest in the language I found an interest in the community and I found a genuine interest to like live in the region you don't have to go that far um, depending on where you are in your life if you're 17 18 I highly recommend live abroad um, if now is not the time for you not all is lost but the main thing is is finding people to participate in that scene with whether they're professional whether they're community members whether they're even virtual or online kind of experience but um, a lot of I feel like a lot a big part of taking on a music tradition other than your own is it's kind of like taking on a language where you can study in a book all you want and you can watch a ton of movies and recognize a ton of things but until you start practicing like articulating it and saying it and speaking it you're not um really exercising the part of your brain that is like learning to access it quickly um so i've always found i study my brains off on some language i want to learn and then i go to that country and i'm like you know dragon ass because i can't like pull these things out as freely and associatively as i as free associatively as i want to so music is like that you can practice something in your room but once you try it in a live context with your buddy or your friend or your bandmate or your teacher or your mentor or whoever then it goes to a slightly different place in the brain which is like a place where you can actually use it and a place where you could tap into it or just kind of hear it playing while you're doing something else and that's the best because it's hard to hear stuff while you're actually playing but you want to hear other ideas and um that tech that sort of tends to work for me when it comes to when it comes to learning um so yeah i don't know <laughs> no, that's that's great that's very uh helpful i think i hope it will be helpful to all the people that are watching this series that's the one of the goals of the slap stream um i would like to ask you how uh, if you have any speci uh, special way to warm up like especially before the show do you do any warm-ups or you just hit it uh yeah big show push-ups push-ups literally just <laughs> backstage warm up your arms and get blood going and just like get just that little jolt um but no i really like long tones for warm-ups and like steady eighth notes for my fingers um I, uh, I, um, long tones with the bow where I, I really focus my breathing. So I'll not necessarily breathing with my bowing, but the amount of st steadiness that I have in my bow arm, oh, I'm sorry, I'm moving my bow hand, but you can't see it below the camera. <laughs> the amount of steadiness I have moving my bow arm is similar to the amount of steadiness I have my breathing. It's important to remember to breathe. And sometimes if you're like me, you have to sort of like, check a few of those things like i'm playing and i'm breathing and then like you're actually breathing and playing for the rest of the night are you looking for something or okay <laughs> and then um uh also i think that this might be a little esoteric and personal but uh if i can hear an idea in my head and then i can it's like somehow easier to play it than if i just pick up my instrument and like my head isn't sort of playing music already so I don't know if you sing but I sing practice with my bass all the time and if I can't warm up or touch my bass before a show or I just don't feel like it or whatever just a little singing warm up even if it's in my head and just whatever you're doing just to sort of like get your head starting to have that pulse or that music inside you that to me means I can almost more reliably take it to the instrument even you know, then uh, if I was just like kind of instrument on, brain on, and let's hope they meet in time for this song to go down well. So, do you ever have issues with feedback, especially with this bass? I know you play realist, and then that uh, pickup is usually. I mean, you you mentioned that you used to play realist. Well, so, I have the realist on there right now again. Okay, so do you yeah. have any issues with uh, feedback? Um. 
Uh, or any particular maybe. way how you fight it. Yeah, well, it's different with the regular upright bass. That's a whole like can of worms. And I mean, there's a million resources on how to sort of find notches and the sort of, I used to have the LR bags pedal, which had that notch, that uh, bass DI, acoustic parametric bass DI pedal, the brown one, the classic one. And that little feedback notch thing was super handy always. Um, this bass feeds back a lot less because it's just has a lot less sort of surface area to sort of catch sound waves in the room. Um, but it does feedback from time to time and it usually depends on where I am in proximity to my speakers. So the main thing I usually do if I'm in like a club venue and I'm getting feedback and it's mostly coming from what's happening on stage is I move my speaker back or more to the side or turn it a little bit. Those are the obvious things that you're going to do. Um, more specifically, if I need to, I'll get in there with like like a, an EQ and try to notch something out, although I don't actually really have a parametric EQ on my live setup, so that doesn't that wouldn't happen except for a sound man. Um, I don't know, for bass players, a lot of it is where we're standing in the room. You know, Georgia, you probably have had this experience too where you're like playing right here and it's like, and then you move just right over here and it's suddenly just like clean and there's no, no problem. So I think because our frequency waves are kind of actual longer waves as they go through the room our points of nodes and things can be sometimes like several feet apart and this isn't coming from a scientific <laughs> position it's just me hypothesizing because i find bass traps in different rooms and and bass free like hot spots for frequency are, are very pronounced and if you're standing in one while you're playing it's going to create a bunch of of weird stuff and if you're if you're not then you can avoid it so we mentioned quite a few artists that you played with. Uh, are there any stories that you would like to share, like how you started playing with them? Because that's kind of like what people, um, I think, are very interested, or I am very interested to hear, because it's really hard to start playing with 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 new people and then uh, take the bass spot or like just being a part of the band and then uh, kind of like some of those can be become like a huge part of your career and you played with lots of amazing artists um, I would like you to mention some of them it's not possible to mention all of them uh, but just like the major ones that you played with and then how did you meet them how did you get in touch with all those people um, well, thank you. Uh, I have played with a different range of artists that are some people, some folks would know, but few people would know everybody because I've, I've played really with a wide range of artists around the world. Um, but how did I meet them and get into those gigs? Uh, in a lot of the classic ways you'd expect, you'd, you'd say the right place, the right time. I was in Cairo in 2005 and or 2004 yeah 2004 first moved to cairo playing in a place called the greek club and this really lovely musician and man uh, fatih salama walked in um heard me playing i was i don't know i wasn't doing anything in particular but um after that night he invited me to join in the project with yusu endure how was, old were you back then i was 23 24 yeah 23 i guess so it was like it was just a case of me being heard by somebody that was in a position to need a bass player and um happened to have a really really crazy cool gig so i ended up working with yusu in senegal several times and was his associate music director and touring bass player for the u.s tour on the year that he took the grammy in 2005. um so that was again just showing up for that little random gig that I was playing in Cairo and you never know who's going to be in the audience and people always say that but it is really I think a, a, an argument in favor of no matter how small the gig is always showing up with 100% of yourself because small gigs wearing you out over time and then you think oh it's just a small gig I don't nobody's really here <laughs> you always meet the craziest people at the small gig so do not screw up the small gig and think that it's just like nothing because 
that's the chance really for you to be actually heard and met by somebody who might have something interesting cooking that you could be a part of too. Getting back to the getting a gig conversation. So anyway, I ended up working with Yusu Endure for those years and that really changed the course of my life. I ended up really spending all that more time in the Middle East after 2005, partly because I was so inspired by that gig and a few others that allowed me to sort of see my life in the region as not just having a lot of local musical stimulation for me, but actually having a way for me to sort of reach new collaborative opportunities with major artists in the world. And so in those 10 or 8, I was really living in the Middle East for like seven years in Egypt and Lebanon primarily. But in those years, everybody I met was somebody I met either through somebody or somebody I met on a large kind of gig that was put together um, featuring sort of a, a mix of world or musicians known or famous or, or prominent in the, in the world. Um, I worked with, yes, yeah, so I worked with Yusu Endur. I've worked a lot with uh, this guy from Iraq, Nasir Shama. He's an amazing oud player in, in person. I worked for years in Cairo with a one of my favorite musicians ever, Hazem Shaheen on Oud. Um, and I worked in, uh, yeah, Omar Farouk Tekbilek. I don't know, when I was in Lebanon, my best buddy there is Zaid Hamdan, and he started this band Soap Kills, and I've played in quite a few projects with him since. I met Zaid. I met Zaid simply by seeing him play in Cairo with a rapper and then like writing him on MySpace, I think it was back in those days. And I was just like, yo man, I've loved your music for so long. I'd love to meet. And he just wrote back right away. And I was like, oh, I'm still here. Like if you'd like to have a copy. And Zaid and I became like best buddies. Him and I have scored numerous movies together. We worked on the Kafernaum, which was went to the um, Academy Awards in 2019 for Best Foreign Language Film. We were both working on that out of Lebanon, Nadine Lebeki and Khaled Mazenar's um, film Kafernaum. And him and I have played in numerous projects and it was really just because I loved his music and I was curious to meet him and we ended up being friends. Um, and I think my favorite relationships in music tend to come from those relationships that are sort of seated in a spontaneous but meaningful way i.e like i love this person's music and they happen to be in town right now and let's just try to meet up or being at the right place at the right time but i think the main thing through all that is you know we're musicians and so the craft we bring to the band is as a musician but what we're doing in 90 percent of the time around playing music is being human being and again, so much of being a musician and being in a band and partnering and trusting creatively your, your colleagues is that outside off the stage kind of thing. So um, just being open to conversation and, and anybody and, and never, as a rule of thumb, I try to just never like make any assumptions about anybody that I'm meeting because it's the most random like dirty t-shirt like character who walks up to you at a party could be like, you know, Dave Grohl, I'm not, I'm, ta I'm not talking about Dave Grohl, but <laughs> it could be, you know, um, I'm thinking about Dave Grohl because of Taylor, but, um, uh, the, um, yeah, you know, you just, and, and oftentimes we, we think, oh, somebody important is going to be here or I should blah, 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 network and all this stuff. But that's such an overwhelming thing to try to like mentally keep track of. So what I would just suggest is that we just keep track of the people that are around us being good to them being communicative to them, receptive to them, honoring their space, honoring what they do, and being genuinely curious about what they do. Because I think a lot of interesting things in life happen really when we start asking questions to one another. So um, those are how it, that's how I got in some of my wilder gigs. I also score a lot of movies for Sundance. Not, not a lot of movies for Sundance. I did one movie for Sundance, but I've scored a lot of document documentary movies subsequently. And so... I actually applied for that Sundance Composers Fellowship, like formal application style. So there's that too, you know, see a program you like. Do you want to get into film music? Do you want to get into this? Apply for something, send in your stuff. And I think if we are consistent and we keep putting ourselves and knocking on those doors, 
the ones that open well, and we get a chance to sort of walk through them and grow in the process. Such an amazing story, and I love your suggestions and your advices. And now you're in LA, so do you think that you're gonna stay here, or you plan to travel more? I think I'm gonna stay here, but I do plan to travel more. I was back in Egypt last year, and uh, in the Emirates, and. But I love LA and now I have a different kind of situation where it says I have a band that I'm really close with who are really my best friends and also, you know, we're really growing and trying to build something on the long term. LA also has so many great musicians coming through. I can play all kinds of classical music here and weird avant post punk and weird world music and sound baths even there where else do you get all that no la is great we have we have such a mix here and there's endless people to meet and um my travel bug will never go away but i'm definitely happy to live in a city that also attracts travelers from everywhere in the world when i can be the one out traveling it, la is such a great place in california in general i i love it out here you know I, and i was thinking like while you were talking I actually moved to California at the exact same time when you moved to Egypt, the same year. Really? You yeah. Moved? No way. Yeah, exactly. So, no wonder. Well, that's for a long time we didn't. I didn't see much of you. You were just a myth. You were just a myth, <laughs> <laughs> like a Sasquatch bass player coming out <laughs> from Serbia. <laughs> um, I think that I pretty much asked you everything I was planning to ask you. Is there anything that you would? like to mention before I ask you a final question and before I ask you to play a little more is there anything else that you would like to talk about is there anything I missed um no I, I really enjoyed your questions um I mean yeah there's a, a a lot of what goes into I guess making a career in music and making one that's sustainable and um meaningful to ourselves too you know um, I don't know. I think music is a, is a chance to have a conversation without words and without tangible, exact definitions of meanings. You know, when we play music together or by ourselves, but really with people, there's so many different ways you can express something like happiness or sadness or positivity or longing or, or whatever it is, or just intensity. You know, there's just so many different shades of intensity in music. I mean, what's intense in classical music is not intense, is totally different kind of intensity if you were to look at hardcore or some of the other things that are out there that are intense. And so since we can speak this language that doesn't have, you know, as many fine definitions as a spoken language, but this musical sort of interpretive language, um, I think that is a chance for us to get to know the world and get to know ourselves better through the process and i think whatever it is we're doing and whether we're playing bass or trying to master some other musical skill or create some other um, musical trade for ourselves find a gig or find an outlet um, i think just remembering that is partly what i like about the format of music and um yeah i guess i'll be in, i'll be on the live chat when this goes up in a couple of days and then we can uh you can ask me any other questions and my contacts to keep in touch will be at the bottom or at the information so all right i still have one more question and before that i would like to uh hear you play a little more so do you mind grabbing this I, awesome bass yes well i think i'll give you i'll do a little improvisation in a few uh modes that i like from egypt um, Middle Eastern Macombs, you could say. Mm-hmm. 
Hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot for being a part of the slab stream. And um, I have one. You called me. I have one last question for you. Yes. I mean, I have lots of questions, but we have, you know, to finish it eventually. So uh, I think this is a good time. Um, after all these years, after all these projects, after all these countries where you've been to and all these music genres that you played uh, during your very rich career, what inspire you to still do what you do? What inspire you to still play music, to be so dedicated and focus on this art? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, I'm curious still. I'm curious to see what what I haven't tried yet. Um, I'm also just really interested in music, you know? Um, I mean, we all know that music is vibrational and that we're atoms of vibrating mediums and blah, 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 and it can sound very, like, so, so fantastic. It's almost, like, too good or too new age to be true, but the more I live, the more I really realize just how much music is like baked into who we are as people, you know? I mean, I could go off on that for ages and ages, but um, our entire psychology has not only been shaped by the music of our ancestors, but it has gone back into shaping the music, which then reshapes our sense of, our sense of identity, our sense of community, our sense of aesthetic, um, our, our ways of celebrating the major euphorias and tragedies of life, you know, um, music is uh, much more than I even ever expected it to be. So to stay inspired at this stage is not, <clears throat> is not really hard, um, just because, again, I'm really curious and I'm really, I find myself just challenged and stimulated by this idea of trying to push past myself or find a, a little hack to my own sort of logic or my own psychology because really what I love about music is when I surprise myself you know I think um it's it's fun to improvise almost more than to play regular written music or to write a piece and play it sometimes just because you don't really know what's going to happen on the spot but what can happen on the spot usually has the potential to be way better or way worse than what you would have prepared so you know you run you run that gauntlet but i still play music today for a few other reasons too um i've got a great community of friends that play music i think it is absolutely the best way to see the world i think music teaches us a lot of values that we can all um, incorporate in the rest of our life and use in other places it teaches us to listen it teaches us to be compassionate it teaches us to be um, aware of the others around us. Um, it teaches us to sort of hold space for one another or to wait for our sort of turn to speak. Um, usually, <laughs> not always. It doesn't have to, by the way. Everybody can talk at once in certain bands. I'm not opposed to that band. Um, but music, though, in general, is just an ever more interesting rich world and I find my aesthetic and my tastes and what I'm listening to even changing a lot as I grow and generally just branching out it's generally just like I'm listening to a more wide range of stuff now than even when I was younger probably because I'm listening to more actual like American popular music than I was for most of my 20s <laughs> um but that said, too, there's just so many things to discover. I mean, I'm, I've been listening to tons of music from Ukraine that I never even knew about and discovering singers and, and vocal traditions in Ukraine just because I'm curious about that country because of the war that's happening there right now. So I feel like music will always inspire me. And what I'll just try to keep bringing to it is um, the right intention to uh, collaborate with other people when we're playing together and um just a gratitude that i have life and movable hands and uh some ideas and you know 
enough of a condition of stability around me to where I can actually enjoy such frivolous activities as the vibration of air. <laughs> Beautiful words. Thanks so much, Miles. It was a pleasure having you here in Slapswell, which is your room right now today. Slapsville, <laughs> a.k.a. my house. Thank you, Georgia. It's such a pleasure to talk to you and talk bass with you, man, for all these always, years. Always a pleasure. And... I usually say to my guests, hope our uh, path's going to cross again soon, but I'm sure that ours will. Yeah, man. <laughs> Next few days again. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Soon. Thanks a lot. Actually, can you sub for me on Thursday? Just kidding. <laughs> 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 but maybe. <laughs> Thank you, bro. Thank you, Miles. Thank you all for watching the 71st episode of the Slab Stream with Georgia live from Slapsville. I'm still impressed with this number, 71 episodes of Slab Based Talk. And thanks to you, you still asked me when I'm going to do the next episode. I became really busy, so it's a little harder, but I'll keep it going. If you have any suggestions who you'd like me to feature, please let me know in the comments under this video. I'm not going to be able to check the live chat for this, but so if you have a suggestion, just write a name and a couple links to in, to in the comments section of this video or send an email to contact at artofslabbase.com. If you'd like to support my work, if you'd like to support the slab stream, make sure to subscribe first to this channel. Follow me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, whatever you do. And uh, follow Art of Slab Base. That's really important. And um, follow miles of course all his links are uh, in the description of this video and if you'd like to really support like sign up for my patreon and um, get one of these art of slap base t-shirts so i have a couple of designs available as bullfill cat clothing so description uh, the link is in the description of this video as well and hope to do another episode soon and in the meantime, don't forget, never fret, slide it in smooth and keep it in a groove. This is George and I'll try to see you next Saturday.